Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Twanda Black, your host. In the African-American community, um, it's funny, in 2014, we still have a certain taboo when you talk about mental health. And uh, here to join us today, Carolyn McKenzie, founder and president of Mental Health in the African-American community. Also, Nicole Jackson, who is the board chair elect for 2015, joins us. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Tawana. Well, well, first of all, talk about mental health in the African-American community. Are we down the road a little bit more in dispelling the myths and the the taboos and you can't talk about it and, and, you know, everybody got somebody crazy in their family? You know, talk about that for a moment, Carolyn. Well, um, it still is a it still is a horrible Stigma. Mm. You know, it's, a, it's more of a stigma mm-hmm, mm-hmm. than a myth, I think, because people are afraid to talk about it in fear that they may be uh, cast in a certain way, mm-hmm. criticized and ridiculed. Mm-hmm. However, um, we have partnered with mental health professionals such as you know, our uh, chair-elect, Nicole Jackson, the president of Just a Journey uh, Counseling and Psychological Services, and we are determined to remove the stigma and break the chains of silence. This year, we had our first annual mental health fair, and we got so many phone calls from people who were calling saying, I would like to get help for a loved one, or I think I may have mental illness. What Mm -hmm. can you do to help me? Mm -hmm. And it was an outpour of, of a need, so there's definitely a need. Absolutely. You... This was born out of a personal experience for you. So talk about that for a moment. Yes. Can you believe it? It's been three years. You interviewed me. I know. July Shortly there. Yeah. And 11. Yeah. Two weeks after the incident, mm-hmm. um, my niece, who I raised as a daughter, dropped dead gorgeous, brilliant young woman, 31, was having a mental meltdown. And I told her husband to bring her to me. And he did. I never saw this coming. Day four of being here before I could take her to get a mental health assessment, she had a psychotic break, and I was in the shower, and she opened up the shower door, standing there with the largest butcher knife in my kitchen. The first stab was to the left side of my head, so fast forward, I was stabbed, left with four dead in a pool of blood, passed out, and then she killed herself. Wow. So that's the short of it. Yeah, yeah. I I remember. I I remember. Um, so, you know, you, you had a long journey to recover, but in that recovery, were you thinking about starting this or was it after? Were you thinking in the recovery, I've got to do something. I can't let all of this be in vain. Well, I started doing it day two of the hospital. Wow. And I found out that she had killed herself. Mm-hmm. Um, my right hand was severely injured and it was in a cast for months. So I had to learn to write with my left hand. So while I was in the hospital, I started writing the strategic plan for mental health in the African-American community. And when I got out, I incorporated it uh, probably the third day that I was out. And I had to do everything with my left hand. And then the next thing, I contacted you. Mm-hmm. You know, and then we formed, it's, we started a movement. You know, your radio interview just sparked a lot of interest. And we got a lot of callers, and from that, we formed a national board of directors, and here we are three years later. That's awesome. We have a national headquarters. We have a national board who's completed their first three-year term. Mm-hmm. We're getting ready to go into 2015 with the new board, and now we're raising money. I've written 20 programs, and I have copyrights for all of them. They're all grassroots programs that are designed to bring solutions to the problem of you know mental illness. There's a lot of awareness and a lot of education. When I went on the NAMI website, I saw lots of problems that were identified. So I tackled each one of those problems, and I wrote a program and a work plan, strategic plan for each one of those problems. And we're tackling them one at a time. So, Carolyn, this was not where you started your career, (laughs) but you're so astute at what you're doing. And and what do you... How do you say all of this is happening for you, Be- um, writing programs? Well, I mean, you know. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like God set me up. You know, I tease him now. I said, God, you really set me up, didn't you? Because my, my professional career, you know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So I created the first national inner-city soccer program 
1989, and I ran that for 10 years. So it's national, and I set it up as a 501c3. So when I finished the Soccer in the Streets program, I started a business consulting agency for nonprofits because I knew what it was like to start a nonprofit from scratch. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be able to help other startup nonprofits. So um, I started that in the year 2000. And then I went back to work for the government. And I went back to work for the government. And I did my business consulting on the side. But I went back to work for Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness. And then after three years, we merged with Behavior Health. So, and then I had to go out and evaluate behavior health programs. And uh, Fulton County Department of Health and Wellness sent me to CDC for training, Emory University for training, Georgia Department of Community Health for training in program design and program evaluation and benchmarking. So when this happened, it was a no-brainer when I was in the hospital. And I said, God, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to fight. I would keep her alive because I know how to set up a nonprofit. I know how to evaluate programs. I know how to design programs. I knew how to do benchmarking. I knew how to do all of those things. So he he literally set me up for this. <laughs> totally, totally. It's been amazing what you've done in three years. I've just watched the progression of everything. And it's been absolutely amazing. But what has also been amazing is folks getting on board, people saying, I really don't care about what the stigmas are, what people think about me. They're really getting on board, talking about and doing something about mental health. Um, Nicole, tell us about when we talk about mental health, what that means. A lot of people think, oh, just crazy. But there's so many different things, not necessarily crazy, but, you know, um, there's so many (laughs) there's so many different things that go along with that when you talk about mental health. You are so correct. And that is one of the first things that people think oh, I'm crazy, or she's crazy, he's crazy, but don't really have a good understanding of what mental health is. Mm -hmm. And so I I try to break it down very um, in a simple form. Mental health is your emotional, it's your social, and it's your mental well-being. So um, it's how all those things kind of work together. And I also incorporate the physical aspect of your health as well because if you're physically ill, that can definitely impact your emotional Mm -hmm. and your mental state. So mental health encompasses every piece and every aspect of a human being. So it's not just so much thinking about somebody's thoughts and they're crazy and they're acting crazy, you know, but crazy is really relative because we all... That's right. We all got a little bit of that now. (laughs) That's right. That's right. But, uh, (laughs) you know, but but really and truly mental health encompasses every aspect of of who we are Mm -hmm. and, and how we operate. And when one piece of that is off, it can definitely rock the boat for every piece. Of absolutely, that. absolutely. Um, no particular um, area, but when we think about mental health, and and you know we see those people maybe every day, or somebody in our family that you know maybe just a, a, a bit off. What are we What are we looking at? What are we you know if if there were signs and symptoms, what would we be looking mm-hmm. for? Well, I definitely think any changes, any abrupt or even over the course of time, changes in behavior, changes in mood, changes in um, just overall the way that someone's living their life can definitely be signs that maybe something's going on. But um, in order to be able to see that, you really got to be in touch with people or even be in tune with yourself. Um, I think sometimes we have those inklings or those feelings, mm, Someone's all just acting a little strange, you know, something's been off. I'm not feeling quite like myself. Listen to that. Mm-hmm. You know, don't just brush those things off. Um, people making comments, um, you know, if, if there's someone who's been sad for a significant amount of time and all of a sudden they're just starting to do really well and they're making plans to, to give things away or to mm. um, do things just completely out of character. Mm-hmm. Those are warning signs that something's going on. So just really be in tune with yourself and your loved ones so you can recognize those shifts and if something is different. Talk about for a moment because we're seeing a lot of, of different uh, mental illnesses in our children. So talk about that for a moment. A lot of parents, I didn't see it coming. But a lot of times, like you said, we're just not paying attention to our kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that, that's the piece of it. And sometimes it's denial. You know, oh, yeah. no one wants to admit 
that there's something wrong. We don't want to admit that there's something wrong with us, mm-hmm. and we definitely don't want to admit that there's something wrong with our children. 